Ever since I was a child, I had a deep understanding and appreciation of physical space. Its order, its complexity, its connection to broader systems. It's quite profound for a five-year-old, right? Well, not as profound if I reveal to you that I'm talking about Legos. Spoiler. The worlds I created were intricate. One set was linked to another set, and they created a greater whole, a Lego ecosystem, if you will. I started to care about those little Lego people in these systems. Were they happy? Were they comfortable? And most importantly, were they safe? I used to get upset when my friends would come over and play rough with them. They would impose their will upon the system with little or no regard for the order that was created. I swear I was a fun kid, just a little OCD about certain things. <laughs> this same order is being disrupted in the real world, in our ecosystems, in our communities. For the past 260 years, since the Industrial Revolution, we have imposed design solutions with little or no regard for natural systems and their relationship and impact on social systems. And this is the result. This is the city of Hamilton in Washington State. Increased precipitation due to climate change has caused an increased frequency of flooding. In fact, a few weeks ago, Hamilton flooded again, along with other cities across Washington. This flooding is carrying pollutants such as oil, gas, and fertilizer into the nearby river, which is disrupting salmon population, which in turn is disrupting orca population along Washington coast. Now this is not just an ecological disaster. The entire city of Hamilton has opted to relocate to higher ground. This is the first wave of people that will be displaced by climate change that we will see in the future. And it's happening in our backyard. The most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which came out this year and was created by 195 countries, has indicated that this is 100% happening and is 100% caused by us. There is no more debate in the scientific community. There is only debate with conspiracy theorists. This report has also indicated that we have already passed one tipping point where we will have to live with the ramifications of climate change. Now, these ramifications are the least severe. However, we only have nine years to drastically reduce global carbon emissions before we pass another tipping point, one that is more catastrophic. And the stakes are high. These aren't little Lego people we're trying to keep safe. These people are real. They're my children in the audience tonight who at a young age already comprehend the ramifications, and the burden they have to bear in the future to either fix this or live with the consequences. They are all of you in the audience tonight. The messaging for the environmental movement over the past 50 years has been flawed. It is not the planet that needs saving. She has been through this kind of disturbance before, and in 25 to 50,000 years, she will revitalize. The real question is, will all of us be around to witness this revitalization? All right, enough doom and gloom. Our motivations should not be driven by fear. Rather, they should be driven by ingenuity and hope. We can design our way out of this. After all, nothing has more strength than dire necessity. Buildings and the materials that we use to construct them constitute 39% of global carbon emissions. The ability to improve the lives of people, like those little Lego people, is why I got into the field of architecture. But the ability to reduce the negative impacts of this number is why I became an expert in sustainable regenerative design. So, what is regenerative design? Put simply, it is design that does more good than harm. It is design that has net positive impacts for ecology, health, and community. It's not enough just to reduce energy and water by a little bit. No, we have to revitalize 
all of the harm that we have done to our social and ecological systems since the Industrial Revolution and even since the Agricultural Revolution. Regenerative design starts with this, an ecological baseline. All of you are sitting on the River Hills ecoregion right now. Can a building mimic the performance of this ecoregion? It doesn't have to look like this, but it has to perform like this. Can a building emit and sequester or capture carbon like this ecoregion? Can a building achieve the same levels of air quality, water quality, and biodiversity as this ecoregion? And in doing so, can a building improve our health? and address any social inequalities that may exist in our community. I think a building can. Here is one that does just that in an ecoregion thousands of miles away. This is the Orange County Sanitation District headquarters in California. It is a 100,000 square foot office complex that is taxpayer funded. I say this to reinforce the message that regenerative design does not have to break the budget. Every expenditure here has to be justifiable. The project itself is laid out so that all spaces receive natural light, and the lights can be turned off throughout the entire day. The walls are super insulated, which allows us to specify a low energy heating and cooling system that is driven through radiant technology, because it's 25 times more effective to move energy through water than air. Does this all sound familiar? Does anybody live in a house that allows for daylight and has radiators along the perimeter, right? This is not new thinking, it's just new technology for old thinking. It is design that responds to the local environment, doesn't fight against it. These strategies, and a few others, allow the building to reduce energy by 72%, which is a good start. What's new and exciting is how we go beyond. The building captures waste gas, from the nearby wastewater treatment plant to drive a boiler to create energy for the project, a truly human-powered design. Now, not every project has a big pile of biogas available for use. My kids are in the audience. <clears throat> so in addition, we've installed solar panels on the roof and the parking structure to offset the rest of the energy. For the math scholars in the audience tonight, these numbers do not add up to 100. They go beyond. This is a building that actually gives energy back to the grid, removing carbon from the system. For a regenerative building, it is not enough to reduce carbon. You have to sequester more than you emit. Now, carbon is not just created through building operations. It is also created with the creation of materials. In order to create these Lego bricks, little tiny plastic granules have to be heated up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Once they're formed, they're put into a gas-powered vehicle and shipped to your house or a store. The carbon required to heat these up and ship them is called embodied carbon. Building materials are the same way. In order to produce one cubic meter of concrete, it takes one ton of carbon. Conversely, one cubic meter of wood or mass timber can actually sequester carbon out of the atmosphere over its growth life cycle. Quite the coincidence. What if we could install materials like this to create buildings that act as carbon banks that store carbon over a long period of time in lieu of emitting them now when it is most dire? Again, wood buildings, not new thinking, just new technology. The Orange County Project does just that. The majority of the structural system is comprised of mass timber. Mass timber can be built up to 15 stories. It's beautiful, it meets all fire codes, in case you were wondering, and it could potentially be less expensive to install given its lighter weight. This building is carbon balanced. It includes some steel and concrete above the line there because we have to combat lateral loads in California for earthquakes. However, through the installation of mass timber, this building sequesters more carbon than it emits over its life cycle. Now, one of the most important aspects of regenerative design is the correlation between these ecological systems and social systems. 
our very health and well-being is intrinsically linked to the amount of pollutants in the air. In the age of COVID, we are all very cognizant of indoor air quality. Indoor air can become stagnant and is often two to five times worse than outdoor air. Carbon dioxide, which you are all breathing right now, especially with your masks on, can cause fatigue, dysfunction, and headaches at 2,500 parts per million. So if any of you are falling asleep right now or nodding off, I won't take it personally. I know it's not me. This is really exciting stuff. It's just that you're breathing. <laughs> now, these impacts are acute. They don't have long-term health implications. Chronic or long-term impl implications can arise with exposure to things like particulate matter, which is a byproduct of combustion of burning fossil fuels. Particulate matter, or PM 2.5, is 2.5 microns in diameter. It lodges deep into your lungs. It gets into your bloodstream and travels to your heart. Long-term exposure can cause cardiovascular disease and stroke, two of the biggest killers in this country. Short-term exposure can cause or aggravate asthma. One in 13 school children have asthma in this country. Twice as many have asthma in disadvantaged communities that live closer to power plants, industrial sites, and highways. This is not just an ecological or health issue. This is a social equity and social justice issue as well, too. And this project understands that connection, understands that issue. This is the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory Welcome Center in California. It's located in Alameda County, which has a 24% asthma rate among its children. That's three times the national average. Because of this reality, this building is designed to be 100% electric. No fossil fuels burned on site for heating, cooling, or transportation. Even the kitchen is 100% electric, offering low energy food options for its employees. To date, about 11 states have adopted building electrification codes, and there will be more to come. It's not enough for a regenerative building to design just to better indoor air quality. A regenerative building has to consider exterior air quality and its impact on nearby community health and well-being. I want to leave you with this. By the year 2022, LEGO aims for carbon neutral operations. That's just one year away. By 2025, they plan zero waste to landfill. And by 2030, they have plans to change the entire composition of their plastic Lego block to be something that is less harmful, like sugarcane. This company realizes the holistic benefit it can have on society, and it's willing to change its fundamental identity to achieve it. Our buildings and infrastructure can and must do the same thing. This is that project in Hamilton, Washington. This is their relocation design. This project is above the thousand-year floodplain. It hits regenerative targets. It's designed to emit no carbon. It's designed to replenish water both on-site and downstream. It provides healthy food and air to its inhabitants. And it does so using technology that is available today not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now, today. But most importantly, it is designed to reconnect humans back to nature, back to natural systems that we should look to for inspiration as we embark upon a journey towards a new industrial revolution, a regenerative revolution.